Hey, 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 we're back. We're black. We're brown. And I am writing solo. Wait, we're brown ambition. I already screwed it up, y'all. Tiffany's only been gone a couple of weeks and I can't even do the intro of our show. But it's your girl, Mandy, aka Mandy Money. And I am not going to be alone for much longer, y'all. This is kind of a weird but also amazing episode of Brown Ambition, a history making episode of Brown Ambition. I feel like the presence of this person has sort of like loomed in the background of Brown Ambition because he's mentioned he's been in my background for years trying to get on this show. And I guess when your little brother asks you for something, there's just something inherent as a big sister that just makes you not want him to have it. (laughs) So for eight years, uh, my little brother, Alex Woodruff, has been petitioning to be a guest on Brown Ambition. And finally, he asked at the right time. I have never been more impressed with him as not just a career professional, but also from a financial perspective, what he's managed to to do just by the tender age of 31. I can't believe he's old, but also that makes me so much older. But anyway, he has paid off a condo, paid off 50K of student loan debt, built his own beautiful, gigantic home in the heart of our hometown of Atlanta. He has an Airbnb property. And on top of that, he is a badass tech sales rep for multiple companies like IBM and Salesforce. And did I even mention that he has this new thriving creative endeavor as a filmmaker. So I am inviting my little brother, my little bruv, Alex on the show today. And I hope that you all enjoy this conversation. I listen, I, I, I try to do the best I can not to tease him, but it just comes out anyway. Um, but straight from the heart, though, I, I love him dearly. And I think that you guys will find so many gems that he drops, even some things that I was surprised to learn about his own career path and his financial path. So without further ado, here is my interview with my little brother. Alex Woodruff. Please go check out his production company, pineapplecutpictures.com. You can follow them on IG and check out their website to find out how you can support their projects. They do incredible film, short films using Atlanta talent, Atlanta crew. It's like such a Georgia Georgia Pride moment. And not only that, but they are telling stories that need to be told, telling stories from underrepresented communities and doing it beautifully and with a lot of heart and high quality. So definitely check them out. It's uncomfortable for me to say so many nice things about my brother. I can't think of it, just whatever. He's awesome. He's become such an incredible person. Now, if y'all want to support Brown Ambition, you know what to do. Go to brownambitionpodcast.com. You can leave us a review. We haven't called out that for it. We haven't asked for a review in a long time. Leave us a review, y'all. Leave us five stars and say a word about the podcast. You can do that wherever you're listening to the podcast right now. But let me stop rambling and let me get into this interview with my baby bro. All right, VA fam, I don't really know how to act because like today's guest, I have read his Harry Potter fan fiction and um, and seen him wear a lot of Pokemon uh, paraphernalia, which memorabilia. You brought, which you, anyway, which you brought into my house. Yeah, did, I don't think I brought Pokemon into your you house. Did, you brought it back from from Paris when you went to Versailles. You brought back the tie-dye Pokemon. I still have the scar from when he threw the remote control at my head so hard because I turned the channel on him. Um, so this is going to be an interesting one, VA fam. But I am really excited to really make this a family event, okay? And introduce you to my brother, my little brother, Alex James. Woodruff is in the studio. Thank you. I don't know how to act. Your favorite how does this... Nepo baby showing up here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, am I the? Whoa, I'm, I'm the so... Nepo baby. Yeah, you're you're giving me the opportunity of a lifetime here. I didn't hear this. I have no idea. How of I could... a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, y'all, I I feel like when was it that your campaign to be a guest on Brown Ambition really started? I've always been a little confused by it. Like I didn't think anyone in my family really cared. What are you about talking about my podcast? I, I didn't. Uh, that's because for everybody who doesn't actually know Mandy in person, Mandy is not really aware of 
how incredible she is. And so well, it's I wouldn't far. go that far. I am a leader. No, she, I think, I think you, 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 you like yourself a lot and that's great. That's healthy, but you're maybe yeah. not aware of like how other people see you. I was, of course, I wanted to be on this show from the beginning. I was mm-hmm. like, what, what's, what's wrong with me? How come I can't, am I not ambitious enough? <laughs> I'm brown as you are. Like this is, I definitely can make it. And yeah. I'm glad I made it. Eventually, five. What does this been? Are you on year six? Or eight. On? We're on year eight. Year eight. eight. Yeah. So when we started the show, you were twenty. You were just getting out of college. But listen, I feel like for any sibling relationship, it's all. I don't know. I feel like our sibling sibling relationship is super. It's it's its own thing. It's super unique. It's very. It's something that I cherish really deeply. And I feel like for me, having you on the show. I was just waiting for it to be an easy yes for me. And I think it became an easy yes, not just because obviously Tiffany is out this month and I just didn't really. Yeah, which I wanted her to be on here because I know. And listen, she'd be giving you so much shit about. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, I wish she, I thought she was going, she didn't want to show her face today. I did send her a message. Let me see if she responded. She said, so far, she said, nice. I told when I told her you were going to be on the show. Anyway, so she, this has her blessing. But anyway, I wanted it to be an easy yes. And I can't think, so when this is the year when I really started to like learn more and appreciate you as the entrepreneur that you have become and how you're sort of managing your, um, your four way and not just a foray, but like your, um, you know, transition into filmmaking along with your nine to five career. And it's been really dope to see you grow. And I feel like we have something to sink our teeth into just beyond like, this is my little brother. And isn't he cute? And he looks like me and all that stuff, which oh, yeah, whatever. Um, I see the little sweater moment. I mean, I you feel like I had to do my hair from I did. over over FaceTime <laughs> over Marco Polo over Marco. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. Oh, your hair goes down now. <laughs> do not right. slander me. Do not. Yes. Do not bring that. <laughs> it looks better than Nick from the Backstreet Boys. Okay, it looks better than him. Okay, everybody in the yes. '90s had their phases. All right, like Lil Bow Wow's hair went down too. I really, I just wanted long hair. You I didn't did. have the words. And you got it. Thank you, you got it. We both have had our hair journeys, but listen, so I'm really happy to have you on the show because I mean, and y'all know from my intro, which I will do, Alex, the magic of editing, you understand this, it'll happen later. But my brother is so much more than that. He has for himself launched at a very young age. What are you like 30? I don't know how long, 31? 31 now. Yes, 31 now. You have created a successful career in tech sales and you know, software sales and sort of like taken everything that you and I share as a passion, like writing and creative, you know, creating um, stories and storytelling. And like you managed to take those skills, but sort of like go the business approach. Whereas I was always like art first and I'm going to go be a writer, like so literal, like I like to write. So I'm going to be a writer and be a journalist. And you were like, I like to write, but I want to make some money and be a business person. Um, So anyway, but we've both, I feel like taken these, you know, taking our unique approaches to our career, but both kind of ended up like in a similar, like coming back to that creative space. Um, So I want you to sort of start things off by talking about your you know, the, the money moves you made career wise, you know, getting into software sales. And when did you start having this like idea that I can also, you know, bring my creativity out and have this creative endeavor, you know, on the side. And then of course, talk about what it is. Yeah. I'm repping right here. Thank you very much for being uh, such a good promotional big sister. I, when you were talking about how I parlayed a lot of the same qualities we share from a passion perspective and what we love about writing and storytelling into making money uh, and being a businessman, I was reminded of a Kendrick Lamar album to Pimp a Butterfly because mm-hmm. he's one of my biggest inspirations as a, as a creative and as a software salesperson or as everything I am. And one of the things he talks about in that on that album particularly is to take the butterfly or whatever that's important or impressive or core or pure about yourself and pimp it, right? And that's mm-hmm. what I've been doing the last eight years. I've been pimping, pimping my own butterfly. butterfly. 
right? I've been uh-huh. make, I've been putting it out there and making money off of it, right? And I think that that's something that's really it's not something to 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 be ashamed of, right? It's something for me that has allowed me and afforded me the creative license and freedom to just do what it is that I feel. So when you ask about you know, how did I make the decision or when was I ready to to transition to doing not just my career, which is software sales. I, I work at a company called Fiddler and we're in, in the AI space. It's not it wasn't that I decided one day to do it. I was all I was always using those skills, writing and storytelling in my business world. And because I had been able to be successful and build financial freedom for myself <clears throat> at a young age, that allowed me to have the headspace to do more music, to do film, to do things that I loved and felt called to do in my free time without the pressure of having to say, I got to make money off of this thing. I have to like go and support myself off of this thing. Mm. We all have time. We all have whatever your amount of time is, right? That, that That's free to you. And for me, luckily enough, I've been able to put that time towards something I'm passionate about. And the results have been, you know, consistently, increasingly getting better and better. So uh, to the shirt you're wearing, I, I am the owner, co-owner of a production company, an Emmy award-winning production company right? based in Atlanta called Pineapple yes. Cut Pictures. And so we focus on creative narrative films, only creative narrative films uh, that prioritize underrepresented stories. Um, and we've been doing that now. I've been a part of the company now for just over four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, you reminded me. I forgot. First of all, I forgot about rain. I forgot about your <laughs> for a minute for this conversation. Well, it's important to remember those things because like I forgot I you were like, doing music while I you were never, in school. Yeah. yeah. I never, I've always been. I think I've always mm-hmm. had duality or whatever the triality or whatever. I've always like an outlet. I've never I've never really liked the idea that I can only be one thing. And yeah, same. particularly in film, that's I've learned because I didn't come, I didn't grow up in film. I didn't like come on set as as like a grip or something like that. I didn't like learn filmmaking from the ground up. I learned as a producer. So one of the things that's as an outsider to filmmaking, I've learned in the last four years is that it's kind of frowned upon to do multiple things. You don't want to tell someone that you're a writer and, 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 and then tell them you're also a producer or you're an actor and then also a a director, people will kind of look at you crazy. They'll say, well, no, you've got to just be the thing that you are. And even for me, yeah. And in the age of like Issa Rae and Reese Witherspoon and like Mindy Kaling really owning it. There are very exceptional people, but those exceptional people are looked at as that. They're not looked at as the rule. And Mm -hmm. when you're trying to in sales too, this is, is, is important. You need to like make whatever the main thing about you, your, whatever your value proposition, whatever it is, needs to be one thing, you know, one consistent thing. So yeah, a lot of people get, af- become afraid of letting people know that they have a nine to five or letting people know that they act, but they're also working on producing. And that's something that is like core to me. I enjoy being multiple things. And so being out front about that, I, I didn't, I wasn't like that from the beginning. I, I hid what I was doing in filmmaking for a little while for the company, from the company I worked at at that time, because I was yeah. nervous. But eventually I realized everybody's doing something in their spare time, whether they're... Oh, you were hiding it from like your employer. Yeah. Okay. At, at first, at first. But at the end of the day, I'm like, how different is this from somebody who's like playing eight rounds of golf a week or something like that? I'm just, it's a, doing you what, know. I'm doing something in my free time that is putting beauty and joy into the world and people think it's cool. So it's Mm -hmm. looked at a little bit differently, but um, at the end of the day, it's just time. And as long as I have it and I can be productive in two different fields at once, I should be able to. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. And I wish people would be more open and, you know, talk about that. It's hard to just, I heard your last um, your your last podcast about like Issa Rae how the, how she's gonna have like this nice hair this you know like like how she's gonna have a, afford this house or this apartment on the salary that she'd make at whatever company yeah like that's that's kind of what we're talking about here is you often can't so don't get wrapped up in this idea of being a starving artist yeah go make some money and be an artist. Yeah, I love that because I was just about to say like this whole trope of the starving artist is like. It's romanticized, but it's so freaking unrealistic, you know, right. and I and I feel like 
our generation. Are we in the same view as millennial or millennial? What it, what are you? With you're the like internet age, I think that like every five years, there's like another gap. So I think you're okay. you're. One, I'm an elder millennial. You're you just are. on the cusp, right? Okay, yes, I'll admit I'm an elder like millennial. Different, but they are getting closer together. They are. It's the, yeah, the starting I get, to yeah. Anyway, so, but like the, the, but we're starting to really rebuke that. God, I keep using that word rebuke. It's so biblical. Anyway, whatever. You. Just like, yeah, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. I rebuke yeah. this idea that I have to starve and suffer. Right. So, um, I love that you're open about that. And I think that we, and again, it's like, first of all, you're kind of like anti social media. It, it grosses you out in a way too. But I'm sure part of that is like people are putting on a front a lot of the times and don't always tell the full story. And I feel like having you share the fact that, okay, I didn't just, you know, uh, skip college and move to a big city and, you know, live off of ramen noodles to make films like, oh, I, I, you had what, almost like half a decade of a career in place, um, earned your money, got those sweet bonuses, everything I talk about from a career perspective, really like harnessing those early years in your career, so that you could, you know, do your art, and get and on do my both. terms, yeah, do my on your terms. On my terms, and not be out here trying to like, you know, when I was doing music, you brought up rain. So when I was doing music, the thing I really struggled with, um, well, one of the things I really struggled with is like, it's always my face. I have to go on a stage, and it's me. It's my face. I have to like be in front of people all the time and promote myself, and people want to know about me, the person, and they're hearing me, the music, and also. It really limits your ability to be a business person and go work at a company like IBM, for instance, which I worked at when I got out of school and also have like graphic rap lyrics out on the Internet. Like it's yeah. it's you can't really have a respect. It's hard to like have both of those things at the same time. And for me, I knew that if I didn't want to put my face in front of everything and be doing touring and all these things that you need to do in order to become a successful musician, then it likely was going to not coincide with me making any money. And so I needed to find a career that could make me money and then an art medium that I could pair with it, that they go together. And this medium of film is so beautiful to me for many reasons, but one of them is that I can pull together music, uh, visuals, sound design, performances from an actor standpoint, like so every, almost every single form of art comes together in a movie. And as you know this about me, you force people to watch it. You bring people into a theater and they can't leave or else, well, I mean, they can, but what? like, it's a captive audience. Yeah. And I love a captive audience. Like, well, how many times have I tried to make you watch a TV show or like make you listen to a song? Like that's, it, it, it just yeah. really you connects. my original you. influencer. Um, yeah. Although now I'm trying to influence you, but you've already seen everything I have, except for you. Have you watched Project Greenlight yet? Because I it's really it. damn good. I've been, I've been bummed because so I haven't really. I haven't been seeing many TV shows. Oh, it's so good though. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So let's back up a little bit because I want people to understand how. So let's talk about. Yeah. Because you've accomplished a lot. I'm trying to think. It's hard to think of you as just like an individual um, who has some noteworthy headlines. But you do. I mean, by what age you had bought your own condo in Atlanta by age what? How old were you? I was 20. It was 2019, I was 27. 27. You yeah. sold that condo and built. I, I also renovated it completely. I That's gutted right. it and renovated Gosh. it completely. Um, yeah. I, I just learned some things there. Which was but. like a year, a little bit after I had bought my house. And, but you bought this suite, you had like the beautiful bachelor pad in Atlanta, in the heart of Atlanta, you could walk to the Falcon stadium, right? The Mercedes Benz stadium. Like it was, you know, um, gorgeous. And then 2021, you started the process of building your own property in East Atlanta, buying yeah, the land, I mean, figuring out how to do that. Shout out to uncle Jim. You yeah. know, Mandy and I have an uncle who and our grandfather had started uh, this housing built this built this construction company decades ago. And I never once thought about the idea of building my own house. I'm not good with my hands. I don't do manual labor very well at all. I don't. Yeah. So it's just never been like something I'd ever considered. You mentioned I bought a condo like that was my thought process, like get something small, self-contained. But renovating that condo opened me up a little bit to the idea of what it would be like to manage contractors 
And when I was looking for a house at the end of 2020, because I wanted something bigger, I was struggling to find something that felt good for the money. And Uncle Jim, uh, who also does some real estate stuff, he was like, have you considered building? And I was like, absolutely not. And he was like, well, I think you should think about it and I'll, I'll help you. I ended up doing a lot of the work, right? Because he's a very busy person, but just the idea, him exposing me to the, the idea. Not the work, but like the finding. The yeah, I mean, like, yeah, the, the managing of the contract. Because at first I was like, great, yeah. Uncle Jim's going <laughs> to show up and just build this whole thing for me. Yeah, no, I ended up having to do most of it. But the managing of it, or the, sorry, the opening my mind to mm -hmm. what that could even be like and the fact that I could build. It's not some like esoteric thing that's impossible to wrap my head yeah. around. That was the key. And so it's those moments that are really beautiful. And I love doing that for a younger generation too, like exposing kids and like young collegiates to, okay, here's what a career in technology sales, for example, could be like, because no one ever exposed me to that and look how much it's offered me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so for me, it's always been like these series of people at close to me in my life who have like opened a door to something yourself included that took me down a path and, uh, all those doors are really fun to walk through. So why limit yourself on how many you can? So what do you feel like are the financial principles that you have implemented to put yourself in a position to like buy your condo at 27? I mean, I feel like you, you, we went to the same university, right? I mean, shout out to the diplomas behind you. When did you go to GSU? That's Megan. So my girlfriend oh, went to okay. graduated from Georgia State. I was going to say, I'm like, well, I don't, I'm forgetting some things, but not that. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, U University of Georgia. The, and I tell this story sometimes to illustrate the cost of college because like I graduated with, I think, seven or eight thousand dollars worth of debt. You graduated with 30K? 50? Uh -huh. 50, yeah. It was 50? Okay. As I said, 30, I'm like, no, it was 50. A yeah. lot, right? And we know you had a little blip. I'm not putting your business out there. Might have lost a Hope Scholarship. Oh my for gosh. A little, for a that little a minute, which, ago. you know, I yeah, never that's a, did. That's important to talk about though, because Mandy, but the you, bar was higher for you to keep your hope than for me. It, right. It Is that was, what changed? That's not exactly the, the situation. I mean, if I'm just being completely honest, Mandy, Mandy has always been, or you have always been a much better student than me. I don't like school. I never liked school. I never enjoyed the going to classes or studying I was always intelligent and able to do well, but I was just pimping it. Like going back to the same point, like earlier, I was just like doing what I had to do to get what I needed to get to get to the next level. And so for me, going to yeah. University of Georgia, getting into those, getting into the, the program, I kind of like, I was doing music at the same time. I kind of lost my, my grip on what was most important. And what was most important is maintaining a good floor, a steady floor. And I think that's a principle that getting back to your question about financial principles, I've kind of held dear. So my floor at that time should have been remain in college, get a degree that can allow you to make money. And what I was operating like was I needed to be a rap star and that was not the right floor to maintain. So, yeah, this, this has kind of been for me and, and going back to, you know, the way I kind of came out of high school and into college and beyond, I didn't. I never thought of it as a, as something I needed to go. I never thought of it as I needed to go to school and be a journalist only and make money. Even though that's what I went to school for originally was journalism. I thought go to school, get a job that feels good to me so that I can make money to complement my artistic endeavors. Mm. And so okay. financial principles, I, I feel like I'm rambling, but the financial principles you're talking about, like, it's like knowing what's what's most important to you. You went, you talked about Instagram and like social media yeah. earlier. Like for me, it's not a good idea to be on Instagram too much because it to me incentivizes the wrong parts of myself. It makes me start thinking about what everybody else is doing. Uh, it makes me start thinking about is what I'm doing likable, <laughs> like literally, is mm -hmm. what I'm doing it like good enough, notable. I don't need to be worried about that kind of stuff. Someone like me, and this isn't to say anything about anyone else, but someone like me needs to be focused on creating, delivering, building a house, getting a good job, closing deals, making movies, getting into film festivals, getting an agent for myself. I need to be thinking about real concrete, like deliverables. And once I deliver on those, that brings along with it financial gain. 
and I can't get wrapped up in trying to keep up with other people or doing what other people are doing, which is, I think, like a financial pitfall a lot of folks fall into, is they mm-hmm. start thinking about what they should be doing based on what other folks are doing or what they believe other folks might be doing. And uh, instead of just following what's in their heart and connecting that to what can actually make them whatever their definition of financial success is. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we've ever really had a conversation about that, but I talk about that all the time. Like if you understand what your core values are, it becomes so much easier to, um, to focus on your goals because your goals are true to you. Like, you know, they're not your goals because they're someone else's dream or, or Instagram's telling you or social media or, or a parent, even the original influencers are telling you, this is what you should be striving for. Even though we have a father who is just like a should King, the King of shoulds. I was shooting l- you to death. Literally just on the phone with someone right before I jumped on here, who yeah. is, she's just getting out of college. She's about to go into the workforce and she had applied to my company as an intern. We don't have any interns, internships available at the time. So I okay. offered to talk with her just to talk about her, her trajectory. And she jumped on the call and started talking about all these big ideas. And I'm like, yo, what is it that you like? Don't talk to me about technology. Don't talk to me about all these other big things that are buzzy and in the industry that you see on LinkedIn or wherever. Tell me what you enjoy. For me, and I gave her an example, I love putting puzzle pieces together. And I like to connect, for example, in a, in a deal, I'm working on a, uh, I'm trying to close a deal in sales. I don't know what the picture is going to look like at the end of the day, but I know it's going to be a deal. Just like when you start a puzzle, you don't know what it's going to look like, but you know, it's going to be a picture. Right. And so for me, like, that's important. Understand I mean, what the it box is. box does kind of tell you what it's going to look like. If you look at it, a lot of people don't look at the box. I look at so, a lot of puzzles. I do yeah. puzzles like every day with my little Well, well maybe my analogy is bad, but did you yeah. get the idea? It's like, mm-hmm. figure out what you like about it. So for me, I love putting the puzzle pieces of a strategic deal together. And that's the same thing with making a film. I love bringing all these artists together to create. The collaboration of it. The, the, the puzzle piecing, the strategy of it, like yeah. the solving the problems along the path toward creating the thing be it a deal or a film, that's what I like. And that's what led me to these pursuits. So for her, you know, it's like, what do you enjoy? What do you actually enjoy about your potential career, the job that you might be doing? What functionally speaks to you and inspires you about it? And then, okay, map that to what job is the best fit? What company is the best fit? Your your parents, like, you know, our when I got out of school, my dad was uh, our dad was very like adamant to me about go to the big company, make sure you go to that IBM brand company. They'll protect you. They'll take care of you. <laughs> and that wasn't bad advice or anything, to be honest, but he doesn't, I had to, at the end of the day, understand I'm the expert in this field. Our parents are very impressive people, but they didn't go to college and go and get a job in the field. I'm trying to get a job in. I had to respect myself enough to know all right, I need to listen to myself here. I definitely want to take their advice and their wisdom where it, where it's applicable, but they're not the ones doing all this research every day. They're not the ones who got the degree and have been at all these seminars and, you know, meetings and, you know, all these things that I've been doing. I need to like listen to myself. I think that's harder for people who come from maybe immigrant parents or black parents where it's like they are, you're kind of conditioned to find security first. And, um, you know, luckily I was able to find security that allowed me to do the things that I love. Yeah. I mean, would you say like, I mean, we're talking about values, but also you combine that with, you did go into a corporate career that I don't know if it was like, if that's just sort of like, cause I've never been in sales, but if that's sort of like the expected trajectory, you're going to go into sales and you can make big commissions and get these big bonus checks. Cause when you started getting these big checks and talking about them, I was like, Holy sh! I never knew this is how that's worked. Um, I didn't know either. But those windfalls, you know, can you talk about like how your how sales specifically was it that you were an excellent salesperson? Do does everyone who goes into sales, you know, at a company like IBM, do they get those sorts of paydays? Like how much were you making out of college to the point where you could afford, you know, your own condo within five years, four or five years? So in terms of what I was making directly out of school, um, I mean, the first year because of largely because of what IBM offered and wasn't because of me closing any deals in that first year. It was just about six figures. And that's what you can expect to make coming out of college if you are positioned well for an enterprise sales company. 
you can expect to make, or enterprise software company, I should say. Uh, if you're going to be in a sales role, you can expect to make around six figures or you should, you should aim for that. Um, so that's what I was making at first, but the windfalls you're talking about closing those deals. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like that. I'm just really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Like just really good. Yeah. I don't think sold there's separately there are, as there are a lot of, yeah, so I heard that too. There mm-hmm. are a lot of people making a lot of great money in sales. So don't get me, don't get it twisted. Like there are, you can make money in this field, even if you're not very like, you know, gifted, but I've, I haven't had a down year in eight years. You know, I've had some years that weren't as lovely as others, but I've always been able to produce no matter where I've been and Mm -hmm. no matter what types of environment I'm in, good ones, terrible ones. Um, it's, it's, it's a career that fits me. It's, I I didn't just like land in sales. It's like literally, you know, you know me my whole life. It's like the perfect type of career for someone like me who does what I do well. Um, and if I had other skills, I'd be doing something else. And that's the point. Like, what do you do well? And are you exposed to a career in the field where you're, that matches what you do well? Luckily for me, I was exposed to this career that matched what I do well. Yeah. I mean, how competitive did you feel with, well, you and I, I think we can be frank. We've always been a little competitive with one another. I mean, I feel competitive, but like a healthy competitive, but also still competitive. I definitely, I definitely used to be. When I was a kid, I, I was, but yeah. I, I honestly, if I am just, I think I've 100% been more inspired by the idea of catching up with you, not ever like beating you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, I, that's what I'm saying. Saying. It's like healthy. Yeah. It's not like malicious yeah. competition. Like you're, always old. you're always been older than me. So you've always had opportunities first. I never knew about mm-hmm. University of Georgia having a journalism school. You went, you went to their school. So I felt like I needed to go. And if yeah. I didn't, I wouldn't have found their business school where I got the degree that led me to this path. Right. So there's always, I wasn't writing Harry Potter fan fiction because I found it. I'm, you know, <laughs> fingers, but somebody, never pointed found me mine, to though. somebody pointed me to Harry Potter fan fiction. And it wasn't, wasn't just on me. So like you've always opened, you've been one of those people that opened doors for me to realize, Oh, I could, I could walk through that door and yeah, I want to catch up with you and feel like I have in a lot of ways, but that is, that was like never the idea to beat you or like to, to be competitive. It was like, I want us both yeah. to win. I want like I want us both to win, but in order for us both to win, I got to catch up because you're definitely winning. So it's like mm-hmm. it's like that. Yeah, no, I think that it's good whether it's like a sibling or a friend, but to have someone in your inner circle who challenges you in a positive way and who makes you think differently. I mean, you were someone I would call for negotiation, like to run through a negotiation that I was going through like professionally. Um, even though you were younger than me in a different field, because you always, even though it would annoy the shit out of me sometimes, you would make me think a little bit differently about something. And I, and, you know, forced me to like, look at why do I feel annoyed by this? Is it because I didn't think of it first? And my little brother told me like, you know, so I feel like that's one of the things that I really value about a relationship now is like, yeah, so a lot of the, um, maybe the, the trite competitiveness, like, sort of is moved out of the picture and it's just more like you make me yeah. better. You know what I mean? Like a conversation Same. with you about a choice will probably make me like m- make a better choice. Do you know what I mean? For the most part. I, I, don't mean, I mean, that's exactly who, what, what kind of person I want to be. I want people yeah. in my life to think what you just said about me. I want people to come I know, in. And as I said it, I'm like, God damn it. Like, this is what he wants. But like, it's not all, I, I can do things on my want. own. Give me what I want. That What oh, is wrong my. with that? I want like everybody I should give everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> y'all see what I'm dealing with, right? No, but like, it's just, okay, give go me ahead, what go I ahead, want. I want to give you what you want, right? Mm-hmm. I want you to give, we deserve that. We're good to each other. We're good people, you know, like we deserve mm-hmm. to give each other what we want. And we, when we deserve like that call that you, I remember that call, like it was yesterday. I was in a hotel room. I forget where I was, but I was like laying on the hotel bed. I was like listening to you tell me about this opportunity and realizing I could help you. And that was such a good moment because I just want to be of service. I just want to help. I want people who I love to think I have something good to offer them. And I want to be around people who I feel have something good to offer me. So when I talk to you about a decision and you give me this idea that sparks a new path forward, 
I'm so thankful and excited about that. I don't have time for competitive. I don't care whose idea it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just don't, I just don't think about that. And also going back to filmmaking is so important because if I go on set as a producer, director, I have a vision, right? And I'm a writer, director, producer. So I have a vision on what I want to get accomplished, but that does not mean I know how to do it all. I need to be very open to the idea that I don't have the right idea all the time. I need to be thinking about other people and their skill sets and where they might be able to offer me guidance. And so you'll get a lot farther that way. Yeah, the collaboration is key. I didn't learn that so much. And because as a writer, as a journalist, I was so focused on me, my byline, you know, how many page views was I getting at Yahoo and Business Insider? And what about my career in podcasting? And how big is Brown Ambition compared to others? When I finally became like a leader, and oh, to go back to the so what Alex is talking about, the advice he gave me was my first my first role outside of being an individual contributor, negotiating how to become an executive editor and negotiating that job offer, I negotiated the hell out of it and got a great base and a signing bonus. But Alex was the one who was like, did they, did, did you ask for equity? And I was like, well, that's not, in my head, I was like, it's not possible. But then I was like, God damn it, he's right. <laughs> like, why didn't I? Um, yeah, so, and and yeah, that, 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 decision for me to go back and ask for equity indirectly became a $200,000 windfall, you know, when we were finally acquired. So, you know, your checks in the mail from that. I know you weren't seeking a commission. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You did for the yeah, right I, mean, I think I was going back yeah. to that moment. And I want to say at the time in my life, I hadn't even got, I hadn't worked at a startup yet. i had had no equity in a company. I, I, I can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure that the way we even arrived at that piece of advice was me just asking you questions about the process. And in the process, in the course of you talking about the process, you brought up equity. And that was one of the things I checked. And that's part of being a, a good seller is to hear what your person is telling you, listen to all the things that they've cataloged and then ask them about those things. So I'm pretty sure you brought up the fact that equity existed or that there was like, yeah, they, you know, I had given asked. that advice in my own freaking content, but exactly, that little right? bit of it's doubt. Cool. Yeah, it's just you made me think, question. why didn't I, which may be annoyed that I had not And I'm like, I'm supposed to be a badass. But why didn't a badass ask for equity? Yeah. So, you know, that, not, I think you know, that's where it came in. That little sense of like annoyance is not in you, but in myself. But still, the fact that I even talked to you about it, I think that was pretty smart. Totally. Um Okay, so leadership. Okay, we want to talk about that. I want to talk about filmmaking. Okay, so you're in sales, you're making bank. That's how you were able to pay off your student loan debt relatively. 50K was gone, it what, was gone in a year? In like 2000, it was gone before I bought my condo. It was gone like Which is hilarious because I think it took me like four years to pay off 8,000 little dollars. <laughs> I think that, so think about that for a second though. Yeah. I had $50,000 in debt. And so in order to pay it off, yeah, I had to make 50,000. How many people wouldn't have paid off their debt? In fact, right. I was talking to you and to dad and to mom about what I should do with the money I had just earned. And yeah. a lot of you gave me, actually no one told me to do what I did. And all of you had good ideas, don't get me wrong. But I wanna say what you had suggested was, all right, well compare the interest rate of your loans versus what you could get out of this sort of account and all these brown ambition investment things that you tell people to do and they're all great, but that yeah. doesn't fit me. And so I had to hear yeah. the advice from the people like you who are experts, but then I had to convert that into decision that made sense for who I am and what makes mm -hmm. sense for me. I can't have that debt over my head. I won't be able to function. I won't be able to operate with freedom and happiness. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I would rather get, I'd rather kill this debt and be not even thinking about it, not even recognize that it's a thing than to have this thing weighing over me and impacting my life in little micro ways every single day. Like I, I just couldn't. And so I decided to take that big swing because I put myself in a position to, and then I got rid of it. And looking back at the way my life has unfolded since then, I really feel like that was a massively, it was a good decision. It, it, gave, it gave me what I needed, which was freedom to operate. Oh, hell yeah. No, a thousand percent. And if you had Tiff on the show, she would be like, jumping up and down because that's all you know we talk about that and she especially has 
made decisions like for her own financial security that her advisor is like, why you could be making so much more money here and why and here and there. And she's like, well, I don't want a mortgage. A mortgage does not align with how I want to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Um, No, a thousand percent. I'm super proud of you. And I also want to point out that like now that you've built this glorious house that is now like the family epicenter for Atlanta um, and is so amazing. You did that by age 30 almost, right? Yeah, by age 30-ish. Yeah, yeah. Not that that matters, but still. I was 30. I mean, I've, I've, I've got the land at 28. Or Hella nine. Young, this gorgeous house. Plus you have, and for those of you who are listening, like to to make the decision to build a guest house instead of what were you deciding, a guest house or a pool? And you turn that guest house into an Airbnb property that is bringing you additional financial security, you know, right. and... I think seeing you do it has made me more confident in making that a part of my, you know, strategy going forward. I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm not going to have a little Airbnb or some kind of investment property rental on the side. This is just too good. It, it's great. Like it. Yeah. I had no. This is again a concept of like somebody exposed me to the idea. I don't even remember who it was, but somebody once. You know, I do know who it was. My friend Austin. He was talking about turning his place into uh, one of his rooms in his place into an Airbnb. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I was in the midst of building my house. And so then I was like, hey, what if we built like a little thing, like a small little thing next to it for like a one bedroom? And so they started talking about the numbers and the numbers weren't crazy, especially given the fact that when you go through and build a house um, with the right with a construction loan, the way it operates is that you get to lock in your interest rate at that time, which for me was a once in a lifetime, Stupidly low interest, low. like yeah. crazy low. Talk about so timing. That was another thing where God was looking out. I got the best interest rate of my lifetime on the biggest investment of my life. So mm-hmm. I was able to wrap all that, in, every all the construction of the house, everything that took place from the day I signed on the land through the day that I moved into the house. I barely paid anything in terms of, I paid like a very low monthly interest amount um, for the entire build. So this house, all of this money is being invested by the bank to build me my house and I'm barely paying anything. So yeah, what's another, let's say 40, 50, 60 K to add to my mortgage when at the end of the day, my interest rate's super low and I know what this place as an Airbnb unit can offer me. Um, yeah. And it has played out just like that. The Airbnb is bumping, check me out. If you're ever staying in East Atlanta, and it's, how can they? Because you won't get your ass on IG. How are they going to know it's Alex's it's property? Not, well, honestly, I'm booked. Because you don't busy, want your so cute little face anywhere. I'm booked. I'm booked and busy. So booked you know, and busy. Mm, is, except for you know what time I'm coming. Where you know what time the Manrique family is know, coming for Christmas. So Believe block me, out those dates, and right. I will be staying for free. That's a that, so that's another thing. Kind of just speak on that real quick. You brought up like the family thing. I don't want my point of view this pen. You brought up the family thing. <laughs> <laughs> let's like, circle back to that. Yes, use some like, use some sales speak on me. Let's let's double like, click that. Hold on, the family thing. <laughs> I knew that for me, it was important to have a house that my family could come to for holidays. When you would so come and visit me. So sweet. When you You've always visit- been such a sweet, pure soul. And I think I'm so dark and twisty that I was always waiting for the evil out. Whether you're just like a genuinely everybody sweet. Is, everybody is waiting on the evil kind out. Kind. It's like, con- like partner, everybody's waiting on the part, other part, shoe to drop. Person. It's, it's strange, but it's only because I am dark and, you know, flawed <laughs> deeply. Um Anyway, I got my but, yeah. too. but like it's but, really but, but sweet. I, I wanted what to you bring, did. yeah, yeah. I wanted to bring everybody in, but that so that means I have to make different financial decisions than somebody who actually doesn't care about that. Like if I only mm-hmm. had one sibling who was going to be coming over, then I probably have like a two three bedroom place. But I knew that I had y'all two. Well, y'all four now. Um, a Mallory and Taylor, mom, Greg, like Megan's family, dad. Like there's a lot of people who I want to be able to call this place home and low key all y'all moved out of Atlanta just about. So I'm trying to ingratiate you to what it could be like if you were to live in Atlanta. So all yeah. those things are important to me. So yeah, I wanted to build a house that could sustain all that. And, um, that was what I set my goals to. So that whole year I wasn't buying, I didn't buy a car. I didn't buy, I didn't invest a lot in my films that year. I, I found other ways to make money to make films. Um, i took all my, all my winnings, so to speak, from my software sales job and invested it into the build of that, um, you know, putting myself in a position to get the good down payment on that house. And you sold your condo as well, you should have mentioned. At the height of the market. Yeah. There were some things that just, it couldn't have been me doing it by myself. Like there was some divine intervention along the way Mm -hmm. 
the interest rate, selling my condo at the exact right time when I did, like the next month, everything changed. It was like yeah. I sold at the perfect week. So I, was, I put myself in a position to be successful, but there's definitely a lot of luck and fortune that was, you know, it's that preparation was preparation meets opportunity, right? Like you put yourself, you had to have the great credit even to qualify for the best score, you know, on your mortgage, which paying off your debt early probably definitely helped and contributed to that. I wanted to point out the car, especially like in Atlanta and especially when you trying to launch your, you know, your hip hop, your rap career early. I feel like it could be it. You see so many you see so much of the opposite in Atlanta and in, and even in my uh, uh, in Enrique's um, uh, Dominican culture here in New York, like it's all about what, what you ride, the car you have, you know, the clothes, the jewelry, the everything on the outside. And one of the things I love about you and one of the things that I am like adamant about myself is the car that you drive is nothing special. What is it? A Nissan something or other? I like my car. It's janky yeah. and it's dirty and you have dog hair all over it. And it's always, why don't you walk? Listen, I looked living at with Enrique has, I like, did you hear what she said? About <laughs> it has what? dog hair all I'm over it. Like that. Like it's the kind of car sometimes you would like. I got it cleaned since the last time y'all saw it. The outside and the inside and everything? Yes. That's well, good. you can't prove it, but here I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you would like write, and you could write on the on the window, like "Wash yeah. me" if you wanted okay. to. Some anyway, right. okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's clear. But at the same time, like millionaire next door, right? Like you know, you have this. I love that about you. You're the biggest house on the block, and I love that anyone who's looking at you as a success, um, like you're a true success. It's not like my biggest fear is that I'm going to be successful to other people, but inside I'm like stressed because I've got debt. I've got, you know, things that I owe. I don't own actually anything. And I feel like you're actually building wealth, which is what I want. I think we both yeah. want that to build wealth. That is not just for us, but for our whole family, the legacy to want, live on. Yeah. I mean, going back to the car thing, my girlfriend is very anti new cars and I go growing yes. up. Our family didn't really have like a history of buying brand new cars. And the car that I based all my interest in what I had, which is a Nissan Maxima on, was the car our mom had, like a Nissan Altima. I just loved the way it rode. I mean, I didn't like love the look of it, but the thing was smooth. I had a Mustang at the time. I thought I was rolling. I would get in my mom's car and this thing was like actually nice. Why did you have a Mustang? <laughs> After I um, got your car totaled, well, I was hit. I was you bought a Mustang in, in college? I didn't though. I, I took the settlement from the car accident. Yeah. Uh, I was in your car or what used to be your car and bought the Mustang. It was used though. It wasn't like brand new. It was like a oh, okay. 2000 at the time. It was like 4,500. Um, but yeah, I, I bought, I got a car that like actually was at the time only three years old. Now it's like 11 years old and paid off. Totally paid off. Years it's, off. Yeah. Years ago. Like, I wanted to get, you know, I talked to y'all about getting a Tesla. I talked to y'all about, you know, getting something and I just couldn't make it make sense. So I just didn't. Yeah. Um, but going, but to your point about building wealth, I got to be honest, like that sort of, that doesn't like actually resonate with me. The idea of building wealth, I think what's more important to me is like being unassailable, if that makes sense. And maybe it's the mm -hmm. same thing. But what Financially I mean is like, bulletproof. I do not want anybody to be able to dictate my life for me. I don't want to go into a job interview and feel like I'm desperate. I don't want to be in uh, trying to close a deal and feel like I need this or else. I don't want to be trying to make a movie and feel like if I don't win with this movie, I'm done. And I think there's a couple of reasons a person might feel that way. One is because they're living beyond their means financially and they, they have to, you know, to keep up. And another reason is that they start believing that if they are not successful immediately, then they're a failure. And for me, it, it's not about just getting successful today. This whole filmmaking thing, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving the ride. This thing could take 10 years, 20 years. You might not ever hear about me until like 2050, but you're going to hear about me. So it's going to happen. And I see the end of the line, but I don't have to get there right now. I'm really enjoying every part of this process. And as long as I can move at the right pace for me, which mm -hmm. sometimes could be sprinting, sometimes could be jogging, sometimes I'm crawling. That's what I need to do. And I'll get where I'm going eventually. As long as I'm enjoying the, this journey, that's, what, that's what's important. So yeah. so yeah, like building wealth seems to be happening for me, but it isn't like my North Star. My North Star is happiness. 
and not being desperate, not being able to be dictated to. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the best thing that happened to me early in my career, which you remember, is when I got let go from my first big girl job in New York City, getting laid off and having that summer to be like, oh, shit, no one's coming to save me. And that was it. You know, for me, it was like, I never want to be so vulnerable. That feeling is something I never wanted to feel. I just always wanted to feel like I got me. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, But yeah, it's like putting it. So I love that, you know, we're sort of talking about putting a name, taking these like generic terms like financial security and wealth building and, you know, like. Uh, you know, rich lifestyle and rich itself. And like, what does that actually mean for you? Like define it for yourself and then just own it. Okay. I want to talk about pineapple cut and I want to, I think the, it's hard because this is not like a four hour podcast. I want to, I want to drill into like what I think is most fascinating, which is the cost and like the, how have you learned how to like make a movie, which I just saw for the first time, a film that you, your team, Pineapple Cut, produced. I saw three of them at that film festival last yeah. November. And even in the in in the haze and fog of having the flu myself, I left there feeling like, holy shit, he's making real movies. Like, this is real stuff. And it was really exciting. And I felt really inspired by it. But I want to, like, as someone who did not grow up in, like, the entertainment industry at all, I can attest to that. Like, how did you learn how to do that? And what would people you think be surprised by in terms of like actually putting up a film and getting it made? Yeah. So the more we talk about, it's always about somebody who I know and love opened a door for me. And I Mm -hmm. saw that door connected to me and I decided to walk through it. So in this case, Abhijit Achar, who's the co-owner of Pineapple Cut Pictures, he actually directed um, my music video in college. And oh, he also, did? Yeah, we worked the one on that with together. you in the bathtub or something? I don't know. I get into all the details. Ah, the of red it. sheets and the red No one will ever see that video, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> he also directed me when I opened for Kendrick Lamar. He did the he did the, the videography for that. So like he yeah. he and I worked together a lot in college. And so we had developed a friendship and like a good collaborative working relationship and he started pineapple cut pictures with some friends in like 2017 or so and i was like on the outside looking in just so it kind of like what you described going to my film uh the premiere we had i was like dang this is really cool i see what these guys are doing this is i would love to be a part of filmmaking i'd love to be a part of this journey with them but what do i have to bring to the table how can i like get my foot in the door to be useful to these people well, obviously there's money. Like I can do that. I can, if I believe in what they are doing, I can invest and be a part of that journey for them and help them make the next film. But I could also help them grow their business. They, none, they didn't know anything about sales. They didn't know anything about how to talk to clients. And we were doing a lot of client work at that time. Um, so I found a way to get in. I got in where I fit in. And that was the way that I started to learn. And Abhijit and the rest of the team that we typically would work with, I learned by osmosis how to run a good set. I brought. So wait, some- sorry ahead. to interrupt. So when you started with Pineapple Cut, I just want to be clear. So did you start as you know? I'm just going to join some calls and give you guys some advice, or did exactly. you immediately make an investment? Oh, okay. So you were sort of like a consultant, like business I, development consultant. It, I wish, but I like casual. Can, but like basically, what happened was I said, "Look, y'all, I want to be in." And they were like, what, why? And I was like, because this is really cool. So let me do whatever I can do. And at the time it was like joining some calls with them and clients, seeing how they operated, giving them advice. And then one thing led to another, I'd be scheduling the next meeting. And then the next thing was, okay, well, we're gonna do a production soon. We don't have a producer yet. Oh, well, everything I'm showing them so far speaks to producer type qualities, managing teams, managing timelines, dealing with vendors, you know, all those things that a logistical producer does, I was showing them that. So I was able to produce a film later that summer. And once I got a taste of that, they started involving, or I, you know, the creators we would work with would have me more involved in the writing, right? So I would be able to review the script and give feedback. And my feedback was really well received. So not only now am I looked at as a business person or then a producer, but also as somebody who might be a really good writer at some point. And so 
I took qualities that I had been developing my entire life and I brought them to filmmaking. And over the course of four years, again, this has not happened like overnight, I've developed the platform for me to now be going into directing my first film uh, this weekend, actually. I know. I'm so freaking excited. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Even though I forgot the name of it. Thomasville. I remember. Thomasville. Don't forget Woodwork about was in my mind because mom was talking about it. But Thomasville is your first feature. Yeah. Reading. I mean, reading your screenplays is so fun because it just takes me back to editing your Harry Potter fan fiction. And it's just like, hopefully it's a little, like a it's little so much better. You still love a flowery metaphor. You love the extra words. It's all there. Um, yeah. you know, but never lose that, but no. So, okay. So from a business standpoint, you know, you start out, I love that sort of casually. And then when do you invest in pineapple cut? Is that how you become a co-owner? They ask you to cut a check buy someone out like how did that go down uh, no it didn't so at the time when i joined two people were leaving they were just they wanted to go into freelancing more owning a production company is not for everybody if you Especially want to be a filmmaker, many, four people how many people owned it they had four people in there at the that's time that's a lot of and co-owners five percent but they were all friends and it just felt good to them at the time mm. all really nice guys and two of them had decided that they wanted to go and be freelancers and they didn't want like the business of it all they didn't want to own the company manage paperwork and you know represent a brand they wanted to just be themselves so that was fine um they left and it was three of us at the time and then it became just Abhijit and I and what I did originally wasn't I, I didn't just put money in like it was the value I was bringing them as a business-minded person a producer all of a sudden like the weekly meetings I was setting how I was keeping us on track with our projects then when I was producing two months later it's like okay I'm literally I'm operating like a functioning member of this group, I need to have some equity. So mm -hmm. what I invested in at first wasn't the company itself. It was in the projects we made. So when we went to go make a series of five films uh, with a director based here in Atlanta, I funded all those projects myself. Right. How much was that? This is a really sh uh, shady topic in film because why? Be be I'll tell you why. Um, maybe you can relate from some of the people you talk to. A budget, you can, I can tell you any budget number, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how much quality or value was actually there, right? So for example, on those films, those five films, I think we did it on like a budget of six or $7,000. All five for of them. All four. five of them? All five of them. That's um, why you had dead cooking y'all. They were, they were, they were, they were, they were <laughs> decent. They were all right, but they're not, they're not near the quality we're making today. But even those People were not being paid what they deserved. People were, you know, we were asking a bunch of favors. People were giving them because we all wanted experience. So, you know, it's yeah. hard to say, oh, here's the budget because I don't want someone who's a filmmaker to go. I need to, to think go. it was shitty. Well, I don't want them to go and or... the goal is not to exploit people to get a lower budget number. Yeah. You know, so I don't want to say, oh, like, look, oh, I, I can do it for that cheap. Exactly. That, oh, OK. Yeah. Not in an ideal world, you could have paid a lot more. Exactly. You would have. Yeah. Now we're paying a lot more. So our last short we made was a fifty thousand dollars short. Was right? that My Sore Magic? My Sore Magic. It was oh, a really beautiful show. film, which people can watch right now. Right. Can you can you stream My Sore Magic yeah. anywhere? So right now you cannot, um, but it will be available um, as soon as people demand it. So right now we're talking with some folks from a distribution standpoint and we're finishing our festival run. Is that where money is? Will you make money? Is this the part where you made an independent film mm -hmm. and you could potentially like you're going to festivals now and showing the film off? Someone could buy it and like give it a wider release or put it on a streaming platform or yeah. something. That can totally happen. However, in short okay. filmmaking, it's very unlikely that you're going to make any money making a short film. A short film is like a it's like you're building your portfolio, right? Or maybe you're mm -hmm. getting an internship. You're doing something that showcases your ability so that you can get a paying opportunity. And so mm -hmm. for us making these short films and for most filmmakers, you make many of them, you make several of them and you raise enough to make finally really good quality films. And then someone gives you that opportunity. So with My Sore Magic, the film we made last year that's based on Abhijit's parents uh, meeting at a disco competition in 1982, India, that <laughs> movie, that short film is is doing extremely well in the festival circuit. We've gotten into like I don't know, a handful of Oscar qualifying festivals. We were just at one in L.A. a week and a half ago. Um, uh, it could. If it wins an award at one of these festivals, it can it will go to the Oscar consideration. So. 
if that happens, now we're industry. in a different category, and yeah, we're going to have people banging our door to get us, you know, to. Do make you a- see yourself like is the is the goal for you to leave, um, you know, the nine to five, the whole like tech because you like what you do, right? But is the if you win an Oscar, you're making films. Is that like you're going to leave that behind? I think it goes back to the pace thing I was talking about earlier. Like, no, mm. my goal is to like just keep enjoying and doing the next thing. So for me, my goal is to direct. And for me to direct, which I'm doing this weekend, I don't have to quit my job to direct. Now, let's say, for example, I make these two films I'm directing this year and they go crazy. People love them. It's a massive success, which is what I hope happens. Even in that scenario, the next step for someone like me is to get representation, get an agent, maybe go direct an episode of a TV show. uh, And then I have a TV series that I'm developing that I want to be the next big thing that I do. So... I don't up until the point where I'm actually responsible for developing a network television show. I can do all this and my nine to five. I don't have any issue with that. I could even go direct an episode of like, I don't know, like swarm, right? I could go direct an episode mm-hmm. of swarm next year and do that on like a two week vacation from work. Like that wouldn't be. Oh, something- it reminds me of our interview with Matthew Cherry. He directed, yeah. he's done some episodes. Of, so he did. It's very close to Matthew Cherry's story. Very similar. Yeah. Because he, yeah, he had Hair Love, right. which was a short that won an Oscar. And then he was like directing Blackish. And right. um, yeah, and okay. To develop things, right? And so, in order yeah. for him to prove to a studio or FX or HBO or who, Max or Netflix or whoever, in order mm-hmm. for him to prove that he's, he's capable of taking on that sort of, uh, you know, investment from them, he needs to go show that he can direct a few episodes of TV. I don't know, Matthew, but. To me, yeah. that's the trajectory he's probably on. And I want to be on that same trajectory. I want to, you know, a year or two from now, be in a position he's in. So when you ask mm-hmm. about why, is the goal to quit? No, not really. I'm, I don't, yeah. as long as I can continue to do both and not have money impact my art in any way, that's my secret weapon. I need to protect that and hold on to it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And it seems like you're laser focused on that. Um, So, you know, now I have this, I'm in a, well, I don't know. I I don't know what to call myself. When people say like, what do you do now? I'm like, I do a lot of things. But one of the core things is I have the Mandy Moneymaker career coaching community, which I've just started in the last couple of years. And you've always been very supportive of that. Thank you. Um, But it was sort of exciting for me in in a sick kind of weird way. Again, I'm a terrible person. Unlike yourself, you're very pure. But when you got let go, <laughs> when it happened to you, why do you reveal like, Im- like important things like this in public? You could have, you've never told me that you liked it when I got laid off. Well, from the sense of like, I love it when anyone comes to me with a real <sighs> life career conundrum and I'm like, ooh, data and project. And I want to watch this story unfold so I can learn to make me a better coach, you know? That's and, a nice way to put it. Yeah. So when you, but also, <laughs> And there's my therapist asked me, she's like, what is it about you and Alex that you think makes you guys um, have so much faith in yourself or successful or whatever? And I was like, I don't really know what to put up my finger on it. But like, I'm not worried about either of us. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about there's no real sense of uh, getting let go could derail Alex's success. You know what I mean? The same way for me, like if tomorrow, God forbid, they take away Brown Ambition. I don't know who is in charge of that. No one because we own it, but whatever. Like I'll I'll find some way. Like I'll be okay. So I feel like when you came to me with, you know, unfortunately being let go while I was concerned and I wanted to help you, I also like wasn't I was like, oh, he'll bounce like he'll bounce back. He's gonna be fine. You know what I mean? Um, so that's why I think I could like take myself out of it and be like, ooh, project. And like, it's fun. But I want you to talk about that because I think you're such an incredible example. And I told you this at the time of professional resilience and someone who, you know, you were at this place for less than a year or just about a year. Um, it was less than a year. It was around yeah. nine, 10 months. Yeah. And you're like me, a job hopper. So how many, this was like your, how many jobs? And I don't know, how many jobs did you have up yeah. to this point? How many years? I would say I'm an un- unwilling job hopper. I'm, I'm searching for long-term commitment. I think I found it. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, I was good. Hear that, I, like, <laughs> Yeah. I was not trying to like, uh, job, like hop from the next thing to the next thing. It's when you're in the startup world in tech, this can happen. 
It's mm-hmm. kind of the risk you take when you go from an IBM or a Salesforce, which is where I worked out of college, um, into the startup world where it's a lot faster, a lot looser, and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. The flip side of that is that you can have massive earning potentials. You have a lot of autonomy to run yourself and your business like it's your business. Um, and it, it speaks to me more. And going back to what we talked about earlier, it speaks to who I am to work at a company that I know the CEO, I have a relationship with that person, and I know what we stand for, and I can reflect that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, getting laid off was tough. It was very, very uh, startling because I think highly of myself. And so while I wasn't shocked because I knew that as a company we weren't performing and as a individual I could have been doing better, but um, I, I was definitely – surprised. I thought that it wouldn't, have been, if it was going to happen, I thought I would have been safe. So it, there's a couple of things I want to say, like, definitely I have a chip on my shoulder. And when you talk about, you always knew I was going to be okay. You're not worried about me. You're not worried about you. Like I'm going to be okay because I'm going to make sure that whoever made that decision regrets it one way or another. And they probably won't. They don't. Ooh, so you do have like a little in my bit head. Of yeah. I, have a, I want to like make them regret it. I want them yeah, to be like, I cannot believe you did that dumb shit. <laughs> Like I, that's yeah. what I want. And so I'm going to force that to happen. And so Fiddler where I work is getting the hardest working version of me like possible. It is the, mm-hmm. I'm on go mode right now because I need to validate not only to myself, but to this imaginary hater who I've created in my head who thinks like I'm going to fail. I'm going to flop like that. That is how I operate. But on the other end of it, in terms of like when it happened and the fear that I had, there's a, a, two reasons I wasn't really afraid. One is that my girlfriend has, has my back. Like she financially can help us out and get us through a period of lean times. And then the other thing, it's not all that lean over here. I'm doing okay. Like I'm not mm-hmm. scraping the bottom. You didn't of the have girl. a lot of cash in the bank, which you I expressed didn't. to me. But you did yeah, have like, an Airbnb. I, 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 like, yeah. Like what's the worst that can happen? You know. after? my massive house and make a bunch of money off of it. And then by the time I'm done doing that, I have a new job and like, you just got to be able to be adaptable. Like, yeah, I wanted this this house, but what if it doesn't work out? That's okay. Like I need what, what's actually important to me as a human. It isn't this house. It's not this neighborhood. It's not the job that I was in at the time. It's like, how do I ensure that, I'm not losing sight of what's actually important to me. And so when I got laid off, yeah, it was, it was scary for a little bit. But once I started thinking about it and I'm like, I'll be fine. I'm going to handle this. And no matter what, nothing's off the table as long as, you know, me and the people who I love are protected and we're fine. And maybe we live in a smaller place. Maybe we rent for a while. None of those things ended up happening. I got a new job in like three weeks, but like, yes. So let's talk about that. So you called me up, we talked about it and like immediately I feel like you were, it was your full-time job to be looking for work and like quickly talk about a few things that you did that you feel like three weeks later you had an incredible, not only did you have an incredible job because we got to the negotiation, which was also so fun for me to like have a, a backseat to watching you negotiate because I love seeing it happen in real time, but you had options in three weeks. It wasn't just like, I got a break. It was you had two or three potential opportunities. So um, I think it's really crucial for people to understand how that came to be. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like when you brought up how I lost hope in college, it was the same exact scenario. Like I got hope scholarship, kicked. not hope in his life. Oh, you're right. I forget people aren't from Atlanta. <laughs> I lost the hope scholarship. I did not lose (laughs) hope as a person. Um, Yeah, I lost the scholarship that I had going to college. And that was a that was a big wake up call. It reminded me to keep the main thing, the main thing and understand what my floor is. And for me, in order to do everything I love and everything that's important to me, I need to be a highly functional software sales executive. And if the place I was at, I wasn't able to do that or deliver, I need to go and fix that first. And if I don't, everything else is now in under threat. I can't invest in my movies. I can't have a lifestyle I want to live. I can't, you know, put into my retirement, et cetera. So it was extremely important. I put to your point, it was like my full-time job for that three weeks was to find a job. Um, in terms of how I got the options, I have developed over the course of my career, a good reputation and s- a several really important mentors, people who have um, vouched for me, people who 
have supported me along the, my process. One of them is uh, Seth Dobrin, who uh, at the time was the president of the Responsible AI Institute, which I'm a board advisor for. And he connected me with a few people immediately, as well as other people. Responsible what? AI? Responsible AI. Responsible AI Institute. AI Institute. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Um, he connected with me with people. I was on LinkedIn, you know, doing what I do from a sales perspective, but now looking for a job and I'm the product. So it was very... It, it, it felt natural. It was scary for the first few days, but then I started getting interviews and then you start, then I'm in the mode, right? I'm, I'm, I'm maxed so out. You, my you reach out to Seth, you reach out to the mentors like via LinkedIn or email or whatever, let them know. Do you tell them? Cause I get this question sometimes. Should I tell people I've been let go? What, you need what, to did, think about, what was your approach? I, I, that's a fair question. I think and you, you had need, a lot of concern about reputational risk too. And I think to those are valid. Stigma. Warranted yeah. and valid yeah. reputational risk because it wasn't my first time leaving a startup, right? In the, in the prior year, I had left a company and went to a startup and then that startup folded. I didn't get let go, but I had to get out because it was under a lot of pressure. So I left for another startup um, and then that startup laid me off. So like for me, my reputation as a job hopper is not something that I think is valuable in my career. I don't want that reputation. Um, mm. I want the best opportunity for me. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want to be looked at as a job hopper. I want to go somewhere and deliver and be looked at as, wow, I'm glad that person was here. So I was worried, yeah, about who I reached out to. And I think for anyone listening, it's important to think about what your reputation is with somebody before you reach out to them and tell them you were let go. Because if they don't think that highly of you and you were reaching out to them and letting them know bad news about you and asking them for help, like maybe you should find someone else. Their reputation could be at stake as well. You know, they have to yeah. really, well, like if, if they well, cause they may decide not to vouch for you just for fear that if they do, like they don't really trust that it'll reflect, you know, well on them. But if someone I, knows you, they're like, Oh, Alex was, Alex ended up here. Not because he's not great. Absolutely. But because, you know, some things happened to Alex. I'm still going to vouch for Alex as the product, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you don't want to, it's always, you're always trying to build the best reputation for yourself with everyone in your network that you possibly can. So mm -hmm. if somebody already doesn't think that highly of me or is not a huge fan of mine, I'm not bringing them bad news. That's not, that's not a valuable investment on my end. I'm going to wait to pull up on them after I have some good news so that I can improve that impression that they have of me. So I'm going to the people, to your point, who already think highly of me, who know that if I was let go, you know, it's like when you have a breakup, you go to that friend who's going to be like, man, they were bugging. Like, that's yeah. who you want to go to in this environment. You want to go to somebody who supports you. Yeah. And then would vouch for you. So that led you to a couple of not just interviews, but like because you're niching into and people who want to break into tech, I feel like listen up because like you targeting, were you specifically targeting startups? Because I feel like that because it's such a smaller sort of, I don't know like companies, small, let fewer, fewer people in between you and leadership, you're able to get that face time with leadership pretty quickly, you know, versus like applying to meta or totally. Google yeah. and, you know, going into yeah. this huge stratosphere. That's just like, it's hard to break into. You need to understand what your leverage is. So for me and the skill set I have and the track record I have, I have the ability to go to a startup who needs the job that I do, which is sales and say, you should consider me. Right. But if you're brand new and trying to break into the tech space and you're trying to get a job like the one I have right now, it might be ben more beneficial for you to go to a bigger company who is hiring more people at once, who has a training program, like what I did when I joined IBM. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be maybe a good use of your time because if you go to a startup, they're expecting you to be ready made. They want you to have gone through training already. They want you to be ready to, literally join and at Fiddler, I was having meetings with customers like a week after I joined because yeah. I already knew the space. I was already, you know, an, enough of an expert to be able they to don't have time to train. Yeah. They didn't need to. Yeah. They didn't want to have to train anyone. So that's the leverage I had coming in. If I were brand new and I were trying to get into a sales job, I would go somewhere with a training program that allows me to generate more skills and a track record of success. And then if I decide eventually I want to be in startups, which is how my career, you know, uh, went, then I can do that. And now a startup is a lot more likely to look at me because I have a track record of success and I've been trained already in a, in a, you know, a valuable program. Okay. 
All right. That's really helpful. I think that that's really good to note as well. Like, and I bring up IBM because I've got some clients who work for IBM and I'm like, shout out to the big companies who give people a foundation of experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's no shade to going to a big old company. Um, but I think what's great is that you weren't afraid to change your mind and you weren't afraid to go in a different direction. And I yeah. recently heard a statistic that was like the highest, and this is a basketball reference. Okay. So obviously I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll this stat was like the top five highest scoring players were also the top five highest missed basket players. What do you call that? Bricks? Yeah. So like they, they had them <laughs> bricks. Yeah. You do call them bricks. <laughs> Uh, so field, field goals missed. So they probably had the most. Yeah, because they're shooting a lot. No basketball. That's not a field goal, is it? Yeah, it's called a field goal. I, it's confusing. This is a tough what? one. What? It is. Yeah. The thing that Shaq can't do, that's a field goal? That's a free throw. Oh, a, field, a free. Okay. Anyway. Free yeah. But my point is like in order to get the wins, get the house, get the Airbnb, you know, get the debt paid off, you had to make like a lot of like, take some risks, like go for it, you know, and the layoff being one of the times that it didn't, that you could perceive it as like, oh, took that shot, it didn't pay off. But look at all the things that, you know, all the chances you did take that did pay off. And I feel like a lot of people that I work with, and even who listen to the show, just are like love coming back, because it's like, giving you permission, helping you feel safer, you know, taking that shot. You have to be failing is, yeah, failing is scary. I have failed. I will fail, you know, in the future with some projects that I pursue, but I'm also going to really succeed because I'm going to keep doing stuff. Yeah. You know, that's why I loved when you first started the show. Like I'm a, I'm an artist. So I vibe with concepts and names and even brands and logos. Thanks to wearing ours again, by the way, oh, follow yeah. us at pineapple cut pictures. On Instagram, or you can follow me at Alex J. Woodruff. See? I may not be on uh, in a few months. I might have to leave. You should have said at the beginning of the show, as I will, because that's, that's what that's most fine. listenership but, is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like the Brown Ambition, the name, it speaks mm-hmm. to everything you just said. It's like you have to have that be your affirmation. Be mm-hmm. ambitious, be audacious when you have the ability to. Like, those are things that have served me very well is when I know that I understand what it is I'm doing, I'm good. Those are the times to be audacious. Those are the times to try to go a step further than maybe where you'd be comfortable. And that's how you're going to, for example, I built a house after I first bought a condo. That was pretty audacious, but I did have a little bit of a foundation because I had renovated my condo. So those things, you know, are important to try. And now whatever I do next, who knows, right? But it's going to be something that's audacious because that's just part of my DNA. I mean, direct writing and directing your first feature. It, it's a short, sorry, short, yeah, short film. Yeah. I real, I real, I learned that from project green light. It's a short, mm-hmm. but still it's really freaking amazing. I wish I could be there in person to see it, but um, I want to end on that note, just like talking about the audacity of Brown ambition and um, how you personify that. And I'm just so damn proud of you, baby bro. Thank you so much. And the feeling is, yeah. Way mutual. I'm so happy. I wish Tiff could be here. I'd tell her too, but um, okay. level y'all are. Y'all Maybe are you'll come so back on the show. I want to be will. back. After I mean, you won your Oscar. Well. I mean, you know, I'm gonna be. You know, I'm gonna be watching the reviews on this one, or like the, like the. I want to get the. I want to get the 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 listening. Um, well, I don't know. You're gonna have to be on IG because, like, that's where. The BA fam is on IG interacting with our clips. Also, you can listen to this on or watch on YouTube if you want to see how much Alex may or may not look like me, y'all. Me. I am the original doppelganger, not Drake. Yeah. People, so then I, no one used this, to say you look like Drake. When this hair goes down, yeah, it's pretty uncanny how much we yeah. look like. Mm, yeah. But, you know, you'll always be number one. All right, Alex, James, Mischief, man. Thank you. Wow, I love it. <laughs> it was either. <laughs> Thank it you. It was either Not. the pineapple cut shirt or the Harry Potter Sorcerer Stone t-shirt that you gave me that I couldn't find. Um, oh, that's the shirt I brought you. Okay, I knew I brought you a shirt. That's what yeah, I Yeah, and I knew it yeah. wasn't pineapple cut, but you know what? I just moved on from that, but we'll you came sure. around. All right. Thank you, Alex, for joining Brown Ambition. Um, you. you guys, 
please run to go follow Pineapple Cut Pictures on IG, where you can stay abreast of all the news. You've got your your shorts are entering film festivals, and I hope people get a chance to see My Sore Magic, which is just so cute, so sweet and adorable and heart, you know, heartwarming and beautifully shot, just gorgeous, the colors. I mean, so much of it. And also Forgive Us is one of the films that really... Whoa, <laughs> very different than Mice Were Magic, but another short that y'all have done. And good luck this weekend making your first film. Thank you. Thank I you. won't try to call or text you. Don't worry. I won't but answer. I will. You won't answer. That's good. Focus be, on the be, art. Yeah, I will be very, very busy. Yeah. But thank but you. It's so dope. Hey, 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 BA fan. We're on YouTube. Woohoo. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And while you're at it, why don't you go over to that little bell icon and just tap that for us. Show the BA fam how much you love us. And that way you'll also get notifications when new videos drop. Also share the channel with a friend. We're always like, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. And thank y'all so much again for all the support.